if you have an, even one Bitcoin to pass on to your children and grandchildren, they will remember you forever. I was attempting to prove election fraud. If people realize, wow, our system could have collapsed, but Bitcoin was there to protect us, Bitcoin becomes an anchor of truth in a sea of lies. Every single piece of data that a government publishes, you should have a timestamp to prove that that document can never be manipulated, to eliminate the ability of the state to erase history and fool humanity. I think that's worth paying to audit the entirety of Guatemalan voting system using Bitcoin. Part of that story is getting Bitcoin to become the timestamp you know, standard for all data everywhere. What are you doing? How did you come to where you are? And how did you come to uh, what you do with elections, with Guatemala, with Bitcoin? It's a long story, uh, but the short of it is I am uh, Carlos Torriello. I am known uh, as Carlinho, uh, for those that are good at Spanish or, or Portuguese. Uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in Guatemala. Uh, for those that don't know, it's uh, in between Mexico and El Salvador, uh, so Central America. And... Uh, born and raised here, went to school in the States, then came back in 2009. You know, great time to, to graduate from, from college, 2009. And um, immediately uh, tried to you know, get involved in, in, in uh, different businesses here. My, my father is an entrepreneur. I, I uh, joined his uh, the family business. And um, specifically with elections, uh, Guatemala has a volunteer army that manages the elections. And so we have... Uh, voting every four years, and I decided to join that in 2011, 2015. Then I came back as an election auditor in 2019 to don't trust verify the results. And 2019 in Guatemala was the first time in over 30, 40 years that Guatemala had um, allegations, credible allegations of election fraud. And so I tried to audit the election in 2019, but I failed. And so I just lowered my time preference and came back in 2023. And uh, I'm very proud to say that uh, the effort that I lead is the first election auditor to audit the entirety of Guatemalan uh, voting system using Bitcoin. And uh, as a byproduct of what we did, the company that I now work for, Simple Proof, is the first company in the world to have gotten a nation state to use Bitcoin to protect its voting system. And that's a fascinating story. Um, let's start with uh, the basics. Why should we use Bitcoin to uh, prove uh, elections and, and audit elections? So personally, and I emphasize, I am not here to convince you to believe in democracy. If you have lost faith in it, uh, that is your <laughs> experience, your, uh, you know, that's fine. I, I'm not here to convince you about democracy. As a Bitcoiner, though, what I believe is that voting systems, which democracies should have, are effectively proof of work consensus algorithms. And in the case of Guatemala, because it's all paper based, I believe they are um, proof of work consensus algorithms uh, with an audit trail that is in the analog world. And in specifically in the case of Guatemala, the system is very similar and has a, look, many similarities to how Bitcoin works. And so I believe that voting systems, and that's what I found in Guatemala, provide Bitcoiners an opportunity to reach a new audience, not with a money argument, but rather with truth. And in a post-truth world that we live in nowadays, it's um, very important to, or at least that argument is uh, material to a lot of people and actually might be easier for them to be interested in Bitcoin. Um, and instead of going straight to, to the money, right? Like I think it's natural and probably very good and healthy for people to naturally reject, uh, you know, these psychopaths on the internet talking about their money being broken, um, you know, that's it's a natural response. But in the case of uh, the voting system, there is this consensus algorithm that takes place and Bitcoin and its immutability characteristics, its decentralization uh, can really help. Um, specifically in the case for me, it was in 2019 when I was 
attempting to prove election fraud. You know, I have friends who are lawyers told me, if you find evidence of election fraud in the 2019 election and you prove it, all that is going to happen is that the government will accuse you of election tampering. And in Guatemala, at least, that is treason. And so I was looking at potentially going to jail for treason, which hasn't happened in Guatemala in hundreds of years. Um, and so I needed a way to demonstrate that the data that I had was the exact same data that the government published. And so uh, I discovered open timestamps, which is a protocol that was built in 2016, 2017. That is a very simple protocol and, and, and application that lends anyone, really individuals or anyone, the ability to use Bitcoin as a time stamping service, which uh, I'll pause there. It's interesting for me. Uh, um, like you said before, 2019, you failed. Uh, how did you fail in, in two, like everything went wrong in 2019? But the, the summary is uh, I was trying to do something very, very hard um, in response to the voting system collapsing. And so if you are concerned that uh, if you care about this, this and I, I cared a lot and care a lot about my voting system um, and you're concerned that there might be election fraud, like someone may attack your voting system uh, and you want to protect it, then uh, you shouldn't wait until election night. Um, and I you know, had my concerns and, and this and that, but I wasn't really prepared for the collapse of our voting system. It's like we have this website that is public where uh, people can look at uh, the data and on election night, that's what the media uses and it just collapsed. So you have people on TV, you know, the TV people, oh, and so uh, Robin is, is oh, I, we don't see the data anymore. Oh, now Carlos, is, oh, the data is gone. Oh, Robin is not, oh, like, so it's it, like everything went wrong, right? And so, um, after the, like when that happened, I wasn't prepared for that level of, of, of chaos. Uh, and so in 2023, when I succeeded was, you know, I lowered my time preference and I, I thought and prepared and researched Bitcoin. I studied Bitcoin and found many useful things in Bitcoin, uh, and was just ready. So instead of reacting to the madness, I prepared and I had the tools ready to go to actually pull it off. If that makes sense. It, it makes sense. Um, how do usual votings work? Like without Bitcoin in Guatemala, how do they usually, con like in Austria, the only thing that I know is like I go in there, I make my uh, thing and I write a name and then I put it in a box. Pretty simple, like wooden box, I think it is. <laughs> That's the only thing I know. Like w what's the, the process from there? Sure. So when I mentioned that Guatemala has this uh, volunteer army, it's you know, who is the, the person that gives you the ballot, right? Um, that's what I was in 2011, 2015. It's uh, the great victory of our last revolution in Guatemala in 1982. Uh, basically, Guatemala, between 1950 to 1980, uh, the votes were, you know, you show up and there's a military guy saying, you know, here's your vote, you know, and so that's <laughs> democracy. Um uh, but in, as of 1982 and our last revolution, we took that power away from the government and created this beautiful system where uh, neighbors are the ones that are in charge of this. So you can volunteer to be the person at the box, right? We call them voting tables. And so you show up very early in the morning. You have this box that contains all the ballots. You have friends to help you, you know, prepare it. And you have a, a, a voting role, right? A list of citizens that are assigned to your table. And it's on average 400. And so this group of, of volunteers manages this system. And um, the political parties who want to compete in the election can all send witnesses to every single one of these tables. So as you're doing this and, you know, when Robin shows up and I give you your ballot, you go over there, you scratch it, and then you come back and you deposit yourself. I, with my friends, we are uh, organizing this on behalf of uh, the 400 citizens. Like we are literally, we turn, the volunteers turn into custodians, right? Uh, and in some ways I consider them like coin join coordinators, right? Because they handle all the individual votes, the transactions. And then at the end of the day, they dump out the votes 
and they visually confirm each vote saying, oh, this one's for Robin, this one's for Carlos, this one's for Robin, etc. And the political parties are standing right behind them the entire time. And so all that the political parties need to do is send witnesses. That turns them into validating nodes uh, in my you know, to, to use Bitcoin terms, right? It's the, the volunteers are kind of like mining nodes or, or coin join coordinators. And then the political parties have a, the ability to send these witnesses, the validating nodes, so that when the voting you know, is counted, then they actually issue a document that is handwritten and contains all the totals of that table and everyone present has to sign. And so it ends up being that you know Guatemala had 9.2 million registered voters in 2023, last year, our last election, 400 people to a, a table. That's around 25,000 of these tables. And so you have a simultaneous like uh, voting system that's happening in 25,000 different places with you know four to five people at each table. Uh, as the mining nodes or uh, coin join coordinators, that's a hundred thousand people, and then the witnesses are again like four or five people, so it's like another one hundred thousand people. The estimates are three hundred thousand people, and so uh, in 2023 we had 4.2 million people actually bother to vote. So it's incredible in that Guatemala has about one in every 21 votes is overseen by uh, people that were there and who also vote there, right? So it's this um, very restricted, secure system with hundreds of thousands of eyeballs watching everything that happens. And it produces this document called, uh, well, the vote tally sheet or the poll tape. Uh, we call it Acta Numero Cuatro. And that is at the heart and soul of our democracy. So if every one of the tables, it's about 25,000, right, per election, produces one document. So there are 25,000 documents at every election, but inside each document are 400 votes. Um, I actually should probably just show you an example because it's easier to actually see it. But the point there is these documents contain the transactions, the votes of about 400 citizens. So that's why they're kind of like a coin join. The state makes that document public, um, but it protects individuals' privacy and, and their secret vote by mixing the vote between other citizens. However, having the witnesses there to fight for the ballots at that moment. And so the only legal opportunity that anyone has to fight for the votes is there. And once the day ends, that's it, right? Like there is no more you know, discussion really, I mean, there's, yeah, it's, it gets a little bit more complicated than that, but it, that means that you use a giant proof of work consensus algorithm to make sure that you have the totals. Um, does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, in Austria, I don't know if you know it, but uh, we had four or five years ago a uh, repetition of an election because there was something wrong. There was uh, there were like two, three things going wrong, but the main thing was like the ballots were not sticking nice, and so like they were opening, uh, and and the uh, the clue was of, like for uh, something that was not standard, like they did some mistake with the clue of like half the ballots or some. I don't know exactly what happened, but there was some mistake happening, and it was actually repeated. Well, uh, elections are, can always become a shit show. That's why you understand that consensus, right? Reaching consensus, having a, a consensus algorithm at scale is very hard. Like getting lots and lots of people to agree on something is very hard, which is why I say, you know, I'm not here to convince you about democracy. What I'm saying is voting systems present Bitcoiners an opportunity to reach a new audience that cares very much about these you know, systems. And if we can help them and improve those systems, it opens a new touch point for people to Bitcoin, where if they really you know, expose you expose to, it, to them and they might be obsessed with how the voting happens and it's like, oh, it's so complicated. And you're like, yes, but you know, here's this consensus algorithm called Bitcoin that achieves you know, consensus every 10 minutes and you can audit the entire thing all the way back to the first block. And so it's let's use voting systems 
to reach a new audience that might not come for money, but rather for democracy. So I think that there's the opportunity to reach a new generation of Bitcoiners that came for democracy, but will stay for Bitcoin. Yeah, I heard you saying in some podcast, uh, elections put the clown world into hyperdrive, something like that. <laughs> yes, for sure. Any mistake like the one you mentioned, we had a huge one in 2023 that I can go into detail about. Occam's razor says the most simple explanation is more often the right one. And uh, Elon Musk, I think, famously said the most entertaining explanation is more often the right one. So like what you said of like you have to repeat uh, the whole voting thing because someone didn't put the glue on like or something. It's just like and this could throw society into chaos. Right. It's like when you realize so much is at stake that one mistake can just destroy society. Uh, that's why we need to bring cryptography like Bitcoin to these systems to you know, fortify them. Uh, uh, and if people realize, wow, our system could have collapsed, but Bitcoin was there to protect us, then people are, are now can, can be exposed to Bitcoin and be like, ah, I want to know more about this, right? And that's literally what happened in Guatemala. And, um, you know, I can I can share my screen if you want to clarify a little bit more of this. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's get into it. Like we have now, like cover like what the elections in general how they work and and how you describe it in Guatemala, how this works with like the the elections tables and stuff like that. How does Bitcoin now come into this um, scene? Sure. So first of all, um, you're looking at open timestamps. Um, this is the underlying protocol. So on top of Bitcoin, there is uh, you know, Bitcoin is open source, but open timestamps is also open source. So find it at opentimestamps.org. And there's, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, you know, all the code repositories, et cetera, is there. But really the cool thing to understand is this has been around since 2016, 2017. And it's kind of like what I say it is the last time in, back then when we had this fight between the money maximalist and the database people in Bitcoin, open timestamps is the compromise of so, uh, a tool that you know, no one is against open timestamps. It's almost I joke that Bitcoiners have um, consensus that tw you know, 21 million hard cap, like we, we will never change that and open timestamps. Like it, I, 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 I've yet to meet a single Bitcoiner that is against open timestamps. So I encourage you to, to look at it. And what you're seeing now on your screen is basically this timestamp uh, system where you can just drag, drop any file. And now I can click this button and oops, where is it? There we go. It should prompt me to see that you might getting a, a download. Uh, it's not coming up on the screen, but basically uh, I can download the proof. And so all that this is, is the user keeps the JPEG, keeps the audio file, whatever file you want to stamp, you keep it on your drive, but then you download from open timestamps, the proof that goes with that file. And so now you have cryptographic proof that that file exists on Bitcoin. This is very easy to drag and drop and use as an individual, but uh, just like Bitcoin, it's hard to have institutions use this, right? So. Now what I'm showing you is the Guatemalan voting system website. You can do this uh, on, on your own. It's, uh, the website is trep.gt, trep.gt. And you basically are presented with this window. You can click between any of the two major voting days that we had. And now what you're looking at is you know, the different elections we had. I'm going to select the presidential election. And then if I move over here, it's starting to say, oh, See, the system is displaying 99.128%. Great. And then I can go down and see, oh, this is the national map of Guatemala. So if you've never seen it, here it is. It's right again next door to Mexico and El Salvador. Um, and then further down, you start to see, all right, these are all the votes that on a national level were assigned to these uh, political parties. And there's you know a bunch of them. In Guatemala, we have the opposite of not enough choices. We have way too many clowns in this clown world, right? Look at all those guys, right? It's, it just keeps going. But the point is, you know, cool database, right? Wow, uh, don't trust verify. How do I know that these numbers on the screen and it's like 100, you know, there's one number that says 41,000, 87,000, 40,000. Like, how do I know that these numbers aren't 
you know, just numbers on a screen that a super admin user can do whatever they want. And so interestingly, I can go to this text box here and I can input any number between one and 24,500. That's the total number of tables. So what's your favorite number, Robin, between one and 24,000? Uh, 420. 420. So if I click 420 and click now, I am now drilling in, instead of looking at the national scale, I'm looking at table number 420 set at voting center 33 in this district uh, inside the country, right? And so again, the system now is showing all the clowns that are competing in the clown world. So we have green party gets nine, blue party got one, yellow party got 10. But again, don't trust verify. How do I know these numbers aren't you know, created by some super admin uh, instead of like the actual votes that the process that we described. Um, so if you scroll down, there was a blue button that said ver. And so now I can actually pull up the picture file that's associated to table number 420. And so this is handwritten do a document from that table that you can see was uh, you know, table number 420 and it's you know signed by Jorge, Ingrid, and I think it says Jessica, but you know, it's kind of hard to see. And they're saying 217 citizens showed up to vote and their 217 votes were split in the following way. And so these are all handwritten numbers uh, from that physical paper that is the paper trail, right? Um, and so all of the numbers are further down. And then on the right-hand side, you see the signatures, right? So these three people up here, this is their signatures. They are kind of the mining nodes or the coin join uh, coordinators. And then under them, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven political party witnesses signed this document, right? And so 217 votes were overseen by 10 people with competing interests. So that paper document is has integrity, right? Like it's, it's people wouldn't sign. Like there's the, the fact that this happened means that the numbers are the numbers, right? And so the tricky bit is we are looking at this on, you know, Ju July, 2024, and this happened in June, 2023. How do we know that this JPEG file is actually a photo of the document that was produced in June, 2023? Right. Like that is the main like if I want to don't trust verify this database, the, if, if, if I can't know that, then I like who cares if I can ver you know, verify this. Like if they can change the photographs, then it's nonsense. Right. It's the, the, the system is great on paper in the analog world. It's when it jumps into the digital world that things can get wacky. Right. Because how do you trust it? And so we actually produced a, a short documentary. It's 15 minutes long called Immutable Democracy that tells this story. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, um, you can find it on, on YouTube uh, for free. It's Immutable Democracy, 15 minutes, and also on film.simpleproof.com. But uh, to keep going with the explanation, uh, you see there's this orange button here that says verify hash. And so... Everything I've shown you up until now is the National Election Authority's website that the media uses to publish the results. But because of the chaos and madness of 2019, when there were election fraud accusations, they added this orange button. And that is what takes you to simpleproof.com, specifically the immutable backup service. So what you're seeing on your screen now is a timestamp from Simple Proof saying that this document was received the 26th of June of 2023 at 12.16 a.m. time zone GMT minus six. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is the time zone of Guatemala and it's saying the database of this separate contractor that handled this data is saying that this document is from that moment. But how do we prove this information? Well, that's where open timestamps comes into play. And specifically, we're publishing, along with the timestamp, the SHA-256, which um, do you want to do a little bit explainer on what a SHA-256 yeah, is? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's good because uh, I think in every 
conversation, every Bitcoin conversation, there's always someone in there that's that's a little bit newer <laughs> to, to, to the game. Uh, or even like people that are long term in Bitcoin, maybe they never bothered to um, uh, get, get into this topic. So basically, uh, SHA-256 is a type of hash. A hash function is essentially a way to summarize digital data into a string of characters. And specifically, SHA-256 uses so many alphanumeric characters that this string that you are seeing on your screen, it's, that starts with E, F, A, 8, B, B, and you know, a lot of other characters, is essentially a, a very large number. It's, it's a number that is so large that there are more SHA-256 uh, than there are atoms in the universe. So what we are saying is this SHA-256 of this JPEG is extremely unique. Like there's nothing in the universe that has this same fingerprint, this genetic code. And so what we described it to Guatemala and the media is because think of this as the fingerprint of the JPEG file, right? If a, if a, if a, if a picture file, if any digital data could be thought of as like a human body, the SHA-256 is like a fingerprint. And so we take the fingerprint, we publish it, and then we are saying this fingerprint has a proof on block number 795,967. Um, and it's on that blockchain and it's a very orange, you know, blockchain. Uh, so I wonder which one it is. And so then further down, you have the date and you know, the timestamp of that block, which is uh, June 26 at 12.42 a.m. GMT minus six. So what Simple Proof is doing here is that you are very publicly saying this uh, you know, contractor that has this database is saying, I got it at 12.16 and then by 12.42, so what, like six, no, it's, it's uh, 26 minutes later, it is, the proof is on the uh, Bitcoin uh, time chain. And so the, the file with this hash can be proven as of that moment and there was only 26 minute window uh, that it hadn't been you know, available to the public. And so some people would say, wow, but 26 minutes for a JPEG, that's a long time you can change it. And yes, you know, it's not impossible. This doesn't completely fix all possible uh, you know, election fraud uh, attacks. But 2019, these files that were published were published six days after the election. So. In this example, 26 minutes, yes, it's, you know, it's valuable time. It's a golden period where someone could attack this, but 26 minutes is 99%, 99.9% less time than six days. So it's when you use this, you eliminate 99% of the attack surface and force would be attackers to, to, if they want to attack the, the voting system, they have to do it on election night as the documents are coming in. When you do that, you force people to make mistakes, right? But again, you know, um, what you're seeing on your screen further down is the original source file. So you can download the JPEG or you can bring it up visually. And so see, now I'm looking at the, the document of table number 420 uh, written by Jorge Luis, Ingrid and Jessica. And I can switch back and check visu visually against the other ones. So these are two separate contractors providing the same information so there's redundancy here, but you know, visual comparisons are going to take a long time. Easier would be to just download this JPEG and you know check the SHA-256 because it's unique to this JPEG. So if the SHA-256 is the same, you know for a fact that not a single pixel of the JPEG has been changed. And then the next bit is the proof. So again, what I was showing you from the open timestamps uh, protocol all you need is to keep a copy of the original source, the JPEG, and the proof. And so this proof is called an OTS file, which if I click view um, and, and I look into the file, what it's showing me is the mathematical cryptographic proofs that show that this SHA-256 is uh, included in a series of other hash functions um, and cryptographic proofs. And so all of this is basically the mathematics that I can use to prove that this file was actually included on Bitcoin. Now, this is a bit tricky to interpret because it's all text-based and you have to know, you know cryptography to do this. 
So what we built is this thing called the OTS Navigator. So a button that says View Merkle Tree takes you now to a graphic representation of what we were looking at. And so basically on your screen, what you're seeing is a Merkle root. So imagine a, a, a series of hashes strung together and that Merkle root is tied all the way down through many, many cryptographic functions to our actual hash of the JPEG. So this hash, again, it's like the genetic code of the JPEG, EFA8BB, right? That's how it starts. Um, let me go back and see the, the hash. It says EFA8BB, right? So it's the same, we're looking at the same hash. And visually, this hash is tied up into a mother hash, which is that product of combining two hashes together to form a new hash. And so it's you, you do this and it's called the Merkle tree. You keep going up, combining it to another hash and another hash. And so visually what you're seeing is the path that you would need to, to follow all the cryptographic proofs to go all the way up to this Merkle root. The difference between a Merkle root and the rest of the tree is that, yes, there's this hash, which starts with 6COC6B, but the Merkle root also contains a transaction ID. And so if you run your own Bitcoin node, all you need to do is input that transaction ID into your node, and you will be able to prove that this information exists on Bitcoin. We provide an easy link to mempool.space, a block explorer that I recommend everyone check out. And as you can see now on your screen, we're looking at block number 795967. Uh, and the timestamp is 2023, uh, June uh, 26 at 42 in the AM, which again, going back to our uh, timestamp from what we have here, it's the same timestamp. It's the same block. But... We are not looking at the block, we're looking at the transaction. And so further down, I can bring up the details of the transaction and reveal what's known as the op return function. For those that don't know, when you run a node on Bitcoin, you can use the op return function to include a short amount, a, a tiny piece of data, of arbitrary data. And so what we've included in this transaction in the op return function is that hash. And so you're looking at 600C6, which is the hash here. And so that is why we are essentially using Bitcoin as a time stamping independent, you know, digital notary that proves mathematically and cryptographically that those pictures that were taken and that we looked at as the don't trust verify evidence of the voting results there they they were created at least on election night therefore you can trust that the jpeg that you're looking at hasn't been altered so you have to also make uh include that in a transaction so for every uh table you you make for every document you make a transaction or how does this work sure so the immediate resistance that i get from bitcoiners is 300,000 jpegs on bitcoin you 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 defiler you 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 graffiti artist and it's like no guys like that's why please go to opentimestamps.org and study open timestamps like i said at the beginning i have yet to find a single bitcoiner that's against open timestamps and i know some very toxic bitcoiners like i talked to the most toxic Bitcoiners you can find about this. And they're all like, it's fine. Why? Because, and let me show you again on my screen. Basically, it's, we are not doing uh, a JPEG on Bitcoin. It's only the root hash that is going on the up return uh, function of the, of the timestamp. So in this case, what you're looking at your screen is like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. I mean... There's like hundreds of these JPEGs all hashed together. So it's the JPEG has a hash and it's strung through the open timestamps protocol to many, many, many other hashes. And at the end, it's just one hash. So a single hash, a single transaction can actually contain the proof that you need for the entire database. Famously, Peter Todd, the Bitcoin core developer that created open timestamps, 
uh, one of the first things he did was hash the entire internet archive into a single transaction. So you literally can have trillions of files all into one single tree and then one hash at the end is what you use as your anchor to Bitcoin. Uh, and so that's why Bitcoin becomes this anchor of truth in a sea of lies that in the case of elections, you can use to differentiate fake documents that are produced by sock puppets on the internet from the official database that the government is using to, um, you know, determine who wins. I've never lo looked at Dopen timestamps before. That's a, that's a, um, an, an, uh, disadvantage for me now, <laughs> but, uh, Like when you uh, verify something on Bitcoin, at some point you have to pay uh, transaction fees. Like yep. at some point you you have to to kind of put mm -hmm. it on there. Um, is that like there are like a lot of things in uh, on top of uh, like in in one transaction there are like thousands or hundreds of things or how does this work? Exactly. So uh, I'll bring it uh, back on the screen. Uh, now I'm taking you to the details section of the transaction. This specific uh, root hash, this transaction had 234 bytes, right? So out of the, the one uh, megabyte block uh, that Bitcoin has, this transaction used 234 bytes. So it's, you know, one in about 4,000 transactions uh, of that specific block. So that is the, the block space that we're consuming, you know, one out of 4,000. We actually did four transactions per block. So it was like one out of 1,000 transactions could contain, and, and really it's like just one, you could contain all of the information of all the internet everywhere. And so that's what I'm saying. Like this giant Merkle tree that can, can contain trillions of files is a timestamp to Bitcoin using 250 bytes. Simple Proof did this for the Guatemalan election to make sure that the documents aren't altered. But now our vision as a company is we want to live in a world where every single data, piece of data, digital data that a, a government publishes, either for public records or if you pay some, you know, uh, speeding ticket or, uh, you know, when they issue your license, you know, whatever, whenever a citizen interfaces with the state and you get some kind of receipt, some document, you should have a, a timestamp to prove that that document can never be manipulated. Um, this is, you know, famously known as uh, Orwell's dictum, and Julian Assange recently kind of put the idea out there again of saying, Bitcoin can break Orwell's dictum, because what Or Orwell said was, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. So another way of saying, History is written by the winners because the winners can rewrite history and erase all the inconvenient things about history. Simple proof, our goal, our mission and vision is we want to live in a world where the government issues the public records. And I can't imagine a world where a government doesn't issue public records, but at least they can't change their mind. They can't erase the record and change it to suit their changing narrative, whims, prerogatives, you know, a new person comes in and suddenly they want to erase everything that happened. That can end. And we want to work on that. And we did it for the national election of Guatemala in 2023. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount Count with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general 
is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. Do you see um, very far into the future and I have like two, three episodes on that where we talk about like UTXO management, where we talk about potential future transaction sizes on, 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 on Bitcoin. Uh, and I think we're going to get into a future where transactions on the base layer will be just really expensive. Uh, so like, I, I really don't care what, what, what people do on the blockchain, uh, because if it's, if, if you can afford uh, the transaction fee, it, it's fine. Like it, that's free market. Uh, then there's a use case for that. Uh, but do you think at some point when like really the, the whole world kind of uses that the, the whole uh, um, uh, the whole Bitcoin and transactions fee is like a thousand euros or like even beyond that? Um, do, first of all, like, do you see the transaction fees rising to that levels, and do you see a um, possibility where like those things might not have space or like something like that? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm showing again on the screen the actual fee that was paid in that transaction. It was 5,911 sats, which was a 38 sat per V-byte. So we technically overpaid uh, two, twice as much as the normal transaction. Um, obviously, right now, transaction fees are still pretty low, even though 38 sat per V-byte is, is not necessarily low. Um, I, you know, <laughs> have... I don't know what's going to happen with transaction fees um, and I can't predict. But the point here is if we do this, it's a matter of maybe we have a few transactions per block that are paying you know, very, very high fees. But if we are handling the entire you know, voting records of all of the world democracies and all of the tax records and all of the uh, you know, public emails of important uh, you know, publicly elected officials, I mean, all... <laughs> If the entire world's information is being hashed into these transactions, I believe that they will, you know, we will always afford uh, to pay, you know, one out of every 1,000 transactions to include all the world's data. So you're saying 9,999 of the transactions could be financial or some other, you know, normal Bitcoin, and then one out of every thousand transactions is the timestamp to all the world's data how much is the world willing to pay for that and to eliminate the ability of the state to erase history and, and, you know, fool humanity. Um, I think that's worth paying. For. And that's a valid point. Like, that's really, really cool. M maybe, I don't know, like how, uh, how opinionated you are on this topic, but when, yeah. when you are going with, with Bitcoin, uh, most people agree that Bitcoin is the best store of value inside of Bitcoin. Like we have this 21 million that people agree on, like this open timestamp that you said, uh, most people agree on. Uh, and, and most people kind of agree like, oh, oh, Bitcoin is a fantastic store of value. Do you also think that Bitcoin will be a currency, will be um, maybe more than that? Some people say like we will build everything that's now on altcoins on top of layer twos and layer threes on top of Bitcoin. Where do you see the future of Bitcoin in general? Uh, I am super bullish. My my life's mission is to get Central America to adopt Bitcoin before the rest of the world. I see it as a race, right? Everything that I can do to push my region and specifically my country to win that race, I want to do. So because everything that I do, like what I just showed you, is helping me, right? Like now the president of Guatemala, his staff... Uh, you know, Congress, people in Congress, judges, they know, they know about this because it was a huge drama in Guatemala where they tried to repeat the elections and, you know, they, they were able to secure the elections. And so all of these important people in the country know now that this use case existed and that Bitcoin helped to protect their, um, you know, victory. And so it just makes my job as a Bitcoiner in Guatemala easier to get people, particularly people in power, to understand that Bitcoin is a tool, right? And this stupid idea of, oh, uh, criminals use Bitcoin. It's like, well, criminals use cell phones. Uh, criminals use automobiles, use the internet. It, does that mean that you're going to cancel yourself out of the internet, automobiles and cell phones? It's like, 
good luck, right? Criminals wear clothing. So are you going to start walking around naked, right? So it's like, it, it just makes it easier for me to orange pill my entire country. But then obviously, now that Guatemala has done this with its voting system, I hope that people listening to this will, you know, visit simpleproof.com and contact us because we are ready to take this everywhere in the world. And your democracy could be the next one that uses this to protect themselves from attackers. And now in terms of the, you know, uh, blockchain, because on the money side, I'm you know completely convinced that Bitcoin is the only thing, the apex predator that will destroy and eat everything else. Um, but on the truth argument, right, because it's separate, it's, and I don't know if you know, but famously some uh, emails, uh, private emails from Satoshi came out uh, during the Craig Wright case, where Satoshi literally said, like, the only other use case that I can imagine for Bitcoin is timestamping. So, like, this, this goes back a while of, like, this is the, like, timestamping information has been known for a long time by Bitcoiners as a useful tool. Like I said, Julian Assange spoke about this as the other, the other thing that really, you know, excites him because we could make sure that everything that WikiLeaks ever publishes is impossible to erase right that's pretty valuable and so um but that's a truth argument like i like i mentioned before it's it's not a money argument but in that argument we actually have an even stronger case than any of the uh crypto um uh, blockchain people because why would you use any other blockchain if what you are hoping to do is secure information bitcoin is the most secure by far. And then because we're using open timestamps, what we're doing is we could hash trillions of data into one single transaction. So this isn't expensive. This is actually cheap. So if you're going to issue NFTs on, you know, Polygon or, you know, Cardano, like you're going to pay gas fees on that other chain. And at the end of the day, those chains are proof of stake chains that are run by companies. And so you might as well just keep it on you know, the data server uh, in, that you were already running. There's no difference between what we are currently doing than running it on another blockchain that's not Bitcoin. The difference is when we have done this in Guatemala with Bitcoin is the government of Guatemala, any uh, attacking government, hackers or individuals, no one can change this data. It just, that is, that's it, right? So we believe that it's important that as Bitcoiners, we bring this technology into public registries, right? Government, because it allows us to make the case that Bitcoin is the only tool to use for this. All the other blockchains don't make sense. And we need to do this fast, right? Bef because they are trying to get their technology used and trying to make it standard. It should be standard operating procedure that all digital files everywhere on all the clouds of all the governments are timestamped to Bitcoin because it's the only way, the only way provable to demonstrate that no one can change history. And so uh, that's that's what I think. That's a beautiful thing about the time chain. I, I feel like, um, as you said it so nicely, when we have the money and all the things that most people uh, listening to that will probably understand. Um, but the other aspect is like having an event that actually happened uh i, I mean it's it goes that easy to like uh, just like i have a telegram chat and and, and we wrote the, there and and we had some event and then people just like oh block height and then eight and stuff like that so like even that kind of uh, is a form of time chain i mean mm -hmm. telegram itself could be manipulated and the number could be rewritten but uh even that in itself is, is kind of use of the time chain um do you also think that it might be possible that the whole time system will will run uh, in, at Bitcoin, especially when the, the confirmation of blocks are not that predictable with sometimes five minutes, sometimes 20 minutes and stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm a fanatic, right? I, uh, um, I believe that, you know, in a thousand years, uh, Bitcoin will be seen as that like before and after moment, kind of like nowadays we, we see Jesus as like, the main like time stamp for when uh you know we start counting years right it's like it's 2024 why because jesus was born 2024 years ago it's like um and obviously like we know that he wasn't literally born that year but whatever it's like 
Um, but you know, thousands of years later, you, it's such an important event that changes humanity so much that people use it as reference. So I do think that over time, that's going to happen. But in the interim, right, in the long run, Bitcoin wins, of course, like Bitcoin already won. What we are uh, discussing is how, right? How is that story going to be written? And I think that part of that story is getting Bitcoin to become the timestamp you know, standard for all data everywhere. And it's almost like uh, you know, when the automobile was invented, at first they had, instead of having a steering wheel, you had these like levers, right? You pull like a bunch of things to make the car turn because it was coming from the horse and you know, the horse you would pull like on him and whatnot. And eventually people figured out a steering wheel is much more intuitive for the automobile. And so now, like if you could see a, a car that has these levers, you would say, how stupid could people have been, right? Like that's what I hope will happen for digital information, especially government public records. In 10 years, people should look back and say, what were people thinking publishing public records without a timestamp to Bitcoin? Like there's no, like, how can I trust anything that the government says if it doesn't have a timestamp to Bitcoin? Like that's how we like how logical this is and, and why we are inviting people to reach out to us to to help us get this out there and more use cases so that we have more uses of this out there than any other shitcoin um because then it's easy to create that story and bring us to the point where bitcoin is that standard right and we can look back and say that you know period of time between 2009 and 2025 when Governments issued digital information and Bitcoin existed and they weren't timestamping. It's like thinking of the automobile with levers. It's like, how could people do that? It just seems silly. It's it's fascinating for me, especially when, when we think about people outside of, of Bitcoin. Like most people inside of Bitcoin kind of grasp more and more where Bitcoin is going and, and how significant Bitcoin actually is for us. Um, but for people outside of uh, Bitcoin, I sometimes have a hard time explaining them how significant this is. They, they still think it's, oh, it's it's some asset. It's like, oh, yeah, I, I also have some silver in my portfolio. So something like that. Um, <laughs> ma ca can you make the case or make you, make the, uh, or can you give us an, 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 an picture in our heads or paint us a picture in our head how significant it is to own like one Bitcoin in like 20, 50 years? How, how significant that will be? I mean, a, lo a lot of people just use a US dollar price target for that, but I'm not the, the best fan of that. Like, do, do you do you have some significance for like owning one whole Bitcoin or something like that? Of course, I mean, the, the answer is not, no one has enough, right? Like that's, that's, uh, that's the truth. No, no one has enough Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, that, but yeah, I mean, what you were saying to, to how to drive home the fact of people that, oh yeah, I have silver, right? I, I have gold, like I own real estate as a hedge against inflation. It's like, well, um, that's why you know, doing something like this and getting to the point where, oh, your, your election system, it was protected by Bitcoin, right? Like, um, like I can talk to the president about that now. And so it's just a lot easier to explain to the president you know, that's how powerful this is. And, and yet Guatemala has zero Bitcoin on the balance sheet. And El Salvador has 5,700 some number, right? Like every day they're buying one full Bitcoin and Guatemala has a zero. Like you, how is it that our democracy depends on Bitcoin as it's like final you know, shield to protect itself? And yet our balance sheet, our money doesn't. Like this is, it's creating more use cases and more narratives where enough of them will short circuit all of the, the, the fear, uncertainty and doubt that has happened over the last 15 years that a lot of people are, you know, um, you know, unfortunately just kind of under the weight of, but you, this, this truth argument, this democracy, this public registry information can pierce through that, right? And eventually, once once a person starts to say, "Well, uh, you know, I, I can prove that our our election was secure because I can show you on Bitcoin." And did you know Bitcoin has fifty thousand you know nodes throughout the world? And, and 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 then you're like, "Well, and so is it on your balance sheet?" They're like, "Oh, no, no, no. I well, I only care about Bitcoin protecting my you know the information integrity, not my money." Then you're like, "What are you talking about?" Obvious, or at least 
should make it easier for us. And so it's the, the argument for doing this is like, it's do it for Bitcoin so that we have more uh, uh, you know, weapons to fight the, 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 the FUD battle, right? Of just do it for the arsenal of examples that we can show people. And so, yeah, be, the fact that I, 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 I know for sure, understanding open timestamps and Bitcoin, Bitcoin can protect all of digital information in the entire world from ever changing and eliminating the possibility of humanity living in 1984 type scenario where the state and the government controls us and, and knows everything. Um, eliminating that just as a byproduct of Bitcoin, like that, that gives you a sense of how important Bitcoin will be for humanity 50, 100, 1,000 years from now. And so if you have even one Bitcoin to pass on to your children and grandchildren, they they will remember you forever, right? That's uh, that's very cool. Um, I feel like uh, when we are in 2024 and we talk about elections, we, we, we kind of have to talk about <laughs> the American election that's coming up as also like 50% uh, of my audience actually comes from America. Um, and then also Trump uh, and uh, 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 Robert um, Kennedy, Kennedy Jr. Uh, and uh, how I started Vivek Ramaswavi. I think all those three uh, will be actually at the uh, Nashville conference. And uh, now it's like two weeks when this is out, we'll be like right around the, the Nashville conference. Um, what's your thoughts right now on the American elections and, and how significant is that the uh, That, that Trump and uh, other candidates are actually at the Nashville conference? Well, um, I'll be at Nashville. Simple proof, we'll have a, a little kiosk. So if you are going to Nashville, please uh, look for us. We, we will be there. And um, I'm also speaking uh, at Nashville. I'm doing a fireside chat with Peter Todd, the, the protocol developer of, of uh, Open Timestamps. And we are speaking at uh, 1.30 p.m. on Saturday uh, up until 2 p.m. And then Trump is speaking at 2 p.m. And so uh, different stages, but so I'm a little nervous that I will be speaking about, and the, the title of the talk is Time Stamping Elections to Avoid a Shit Show. So to all the, uh, you know, United Statesian Bitcoiners listening to this, uh, yeah, it's going to be a shit show. I think you can guarantee that uh, in November, but Bitcoin actually helps us avoid that. Um, and actually, if you want, I can share my screen and it's, The fact that this was used, like you could ask, so what, what was, what's the, the point of using uh, Bitcoin to protect your voting system? And so what I'm showing on your screen is the uh, election crimes unit argument of the Guatemalan justice system saying why the election was stolen. And it's basically a, uh, on the x-axis is voting day, right? Um, and so it's zero hours on, on election day in 2023. And it goes for about two days, so 48 hours. And then on the y-axis, it's uh, the number of documents generated by the system. And so the election crimes unit in Guatemala is taking the election authorities to court, accusing them of election fraud by arguing that the smoking gun evidence is that JPEGs published by the authorities have in the metadata um, timestamps that are prior to the polls closing. So... How is it that a, a JPEG file can exist prior to the polls closing? That for them has been, this is proof and evidence that there was election manipulation and therefore a crime. However, when you overlay the information on Bitcoin, instead of seeing information from uh, coming from different uh, times, suddenly there is a normal distribution that happens after 6 p.m. But more importantly, This biggest chunk over here, well, I mean, that's 50% of the files have a timestamp that is in the future compared to the timestamp to Bitcoin. And so why do you use this technology to avoid a shit show? Because thanks to the election authorities using Bitcoin, we can prove mathematically that there was no election fraud. Otherwise... There would need to be proof that time travelers hacked the Guatemalan election because there is no way that a JPEG can exist in the future when it existed in the past on Bitcoin. 
the more plausible explanation is that someone made a mistake. And this is what, you know, tying it to what you were talking about in Austria, where the glue like wasn't done well in Guatemala in 2023, the contractor that was generating the files misconfigured the time zones in 3% of the computers. And so they thought they were in the Pacific Islands, uh, you know, 11 hours ahead of Guatemala. And then 53% of the hardware thought it was in Baghdad, Iraq. But when you, con when you correct for the time zone error, it all sandwiches into Guatemalan time zone. And so it provides cryptographic proof that it was a mistake. And so instead of falling into the shit show of people saying election fraud, this or that, Bitcoin provides that anchor of truth where you can look at it and say, ooh, we can prove that this is what happened. And this, you know, it's not about my guy lost, your guy won. It's this is what literally happened. And so, you know, to, why am I saying this? It's we are literally taking this argument to Nashville and, and I'm calling upon Bitcoiners everywhere to reach out to us because the way that the United States election system works is that there are 50 states. Each one has their own election law inside each state. The authorities responsible for carrying out the voting are county clerks. So small local government. And those are the guys that could use this technology to keep them from going to jail. And so it's very cheap insurance for your local authority. That means that there's about 3,000 counties in the United States. So there's about 3,000 people in the USA that could choose to use Bitcoin to protect the voting system. And my message to Bitcoiners is, what are the odds that that election authority is your neighbor, your cousin, your dad, or yourself, right? At this point, Bitcoiners are everywhere there's a chance that, that one of those 3,000 is already a Bitcoiner or is a very close friend to a Bitcoiner. And so please reach out to us because in November, that person could use Bitcoin to protect themselves against a stupid mistake like time zone misconfiguration or glue you know, problems and just b use Bitcoin so that if the shit hits the fan and we know it's going to be a shit show, you have Bitcoin. And Bitcoin becomes an anchor of truth in a sea of lies. The benefit to that person is they can keep themselves from going to jail if they are unlucky to be accused of election fraud. And the benefit to Bitcoiners is by December, we can credibly say that Bitcoin protects democracy. And if Bitcoin protects democracy in the United States of America, then if you're against Bitcoin, you must be against democracy. Uh, I, <laughs> I love it a lot. Um... We had last year, uh, no, last time uh, Trump was not elected, Biden was elected, heavy allegations uh, from Trump's side, from uh, the Republicans that there was election fraud. I mean, we had the whole whole drama around that. Um, might be Trump a big fan of, of, of exactly your pro project? We shall see in Nashville. We are taking this argument to the Genesis stage um, and we'll have a kiosk there and we're talking to everyone there. There's already about eight Bitcoiners or in eight different states that have reached out to us. So please, we are you know, simpleproof.com. We're on Noster as Simple Proof. I'm on Twitter as Carlos Torriello. Uh, you know, maybe include that link because it'll be hard to, to find. Um, and just reach out to us because uh, we also offer a 5% referral fee. So if you introduce us to a local government that uses this and we sign a contract, we'll give you 5% of that contract. That being said, it's, it's, you know, do it really more to, because if you're the one that gets us introduced to, 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 to the, you know, your local government that we do this, then you become the legendary Bitcoiner who got Bitcoin inside the United States voting system. And we'll timestamp that and, and it will live forever, right? You can be that legendary Bitcoiner that created this art, this narrative of Bitcoin protects democracy. So that next time that uh, some politician is arguing that the Bitcoin miners are using too much energy and we should shut them down because it's these mathematical formulas that just waste energy, we can you know bring in your local authority and ask, you know, did Bitcoin help you? Like, is Bitcoin useful to protect voting? 
And if you if now you are going against the system, arguing Bitcoin protects democracy, we can't shut down the miners because the miners are protecting democracy. Then we flipped you know, most of the attacks against us on their head. And that should protect the network from these political attacks, from these alleged you know, democracy lovers um, and you know, expose them for the frauds that they are and demonstrate Bitcoin's utility, like I said, in truth and in being the only you know, credible database in the entire world. I mean, that's um, a massive incentive <laughs> for people to do that. Uh, I'm, I already love that uh, that you are on that mission and that uh, that you did that in Guatemala. And I can only wonder um, how long it takes, but it's probably faster than we think with, with Bitcoin and with the network effect and people getting it and like who could have imagined just like two years ago that the current president of uh, like, like the, the probably next president or like the yeah. former president uh, Trump is talking so openly about Bitcoin that he goes to Bitcoin conferences. Uh, and it's not that he, uh, he is a Bitcoin, I don't think so, but he uh, definitely knows that he needs to talk about Bitcoin. We, we haven't, like, for better or worse, Bitcoin has become a political issue in this campaign. It's not the most important issue, but it is an issue. And so let's not waste the opportunity to say, to negotiate with these political forces and say, oh, you, you, you want our vote? Well, then let's get Bitcoin to protect the information. And I'll, I'll emphasize simpleproof.com. Our solution is an information integrity solution. This doesn't mean that we want to you know, touch your ballots. This doesn't mean we want like to, no, no, none of that. This is literally just a backup of your data. Like your local authority during the elections, they will produce some data. How, in whatever process they have, we adapt to it. And this just runs as a parallel, you know, independent notary, you know, a digital notary of what happened. And so it's in terms of implementation, if you're wondering, in Guatemala, the election authority signed the contract four days prior to the election. And we were still able to implement the technology because it's simple, yeah? simple proof, right? It's reduced all the complexity and make it so that you know, a few buttons are clicked and boom, the magic just happens and it works. You know, opentimestamps.org, uh, uh, if you go, you can see how easy it is for an individual. It's much harder for in, in, uh, institutions, especially like governments that, you know, so we, we just make all of that very simple. Uh, but of course, if you're listening to this, reach out to your election authority, ask them, do you have a plan come November if, you know, Russian hackers attack you with artificial intelligence, if your contractor makes a mistake and deletes all the data, uh, or has the wrong time zones, or there's a power outage, just like it's purely just a redundancy, you know, insurance plan that you can point to what happened in Guatemala and, and tell them these guys have a cheap solution because it's not expensive and it's already helping election authorities in Guatemala avoid going to jail. So you should at least take a look at this, right? Because who wants to go to jail, right? And so... Um, yeah, we're just putting up the bat signal and, 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 you know, there are already eight people working on this that want to become that legendary Bitcoiner. So, uh, you know, reach out soon because the race is on. I love it a lot. Um, before we come to our end routine, I have one question that I always ask my, ask, ask my, my guests uh, to get something outside of Bitcoin into the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? Like I said, uh, democracy, I'm not going to ask you to believe in it. I'm going to call, you, I'll call on you to, to see it, and particularly the voting system. You know, who cares about who's competing? Et cetera? It's just the voting system is a consensus algorithm that a lot of people care about. And it provides a proxy, a, a different touch point to reach people with a message that eventually leads to Bitcoin, right? These voting systems consume our attention, consume our energy, sometimes create conditions for war. And there's this other consensus algorithm that reaches perfect consent, well, not perfect, but is the best consensus possible 
and it's every 10 minutes. So I encourage you to consider democracy as a means of reaching people with a different message. You're probably at this point sick of working for the Bitcoin marketing team, sick of talking to your family members. They all think you're crazy. But if you talk to them about this, then and, and there's a 15 minute documentary that you could send them immutable democracy to say this happened in Guatemala. Guatemala's democracy was defended. And in, in no small part, we may still be a democracy just because of Bitcoin. So it's not about, hey, you know, forget about gold and real estate. Like that's a much harder argument. So uh, I invite you to, to do that because, um, you know, monarchies, autocracies, they, they are becoming, you know, more popular. And, you know, go for it. If you want to go, you know, live in, in Dubai or some other, you know, autocratic state, go for it. But realize that democracies may be a, you know, factory of Bitcoiners. Every voting system we can use this to just drive home the fact that Bitcoin is useful. That's not something that autocracies have. And so I believe that democracies have a unique advantage to adopt Bitcoin faster than autocracies simply because of the proof of work consensus algorithm that voting systems represent. And the fact that it lowers people's uh, um, barriers to being curious and, and, and studying Bitcoin. Really cool. Um, let's come to the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest oh. without knowing who the next guest is. Um, this question is even even hard to ask because it's so long and it has so okay. much uh, things in there. I might I, like I, I might have to repeat it. I, I had to re let it repeat to to myself uh, the first time I heard it. Um, what is the one thing that you can do and enjoy that you doing uh, that you don't get paid? that helps others and why aren't you doing more of it? Why am I not doing more of it? I, well, I, I, some, some people would say I'm doing too much of it. Um, I am auditing my uh, election. Uh, so I believe that running uh, nodes is important. We should strive to try to get as many people to run nodes. And I am the first person in the history of Guatemala to run a full node on the voting system. So I verified the entire voting system and I checked the entire thing against what they are publishing to find the discrepancies and, 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 and the matches to start identifying whether or not our democracy is legitimate. Um, and I'm going, I am doing more of it. I'm, I, I tried to do it in El Salvador and in Panama, Republica Dominicana, Mexico, and I'm actually also open to doing it in the States. This is separate to... Simple proof, uh, if you're curious, it's digitalwitness.io. Um, and I do want to do more of it. It's just hard to get into other people's democracies and, and their voting systems. It's, uh, you need to be invited. Uh, but yes, I'm, a, I'm an election auditor. And I believe that auditing elections is effectively running a full node on democracy. Um, and I think that if more, that's why democracies present this opportunity to farm not just people exposed to Bitcoin as a new touch point, but to farm node runners. Uh, and I think we need more ro node runners and democracies can create that. So it's, it's, it's basically, I came for democracy, but I stayed for Bitcoin. Okay. Um, Carlos, thank you for, for being on. Thank you for explaining what, what, what you're doing. Uh, thank you for joining us today. For all, also for everyone watching and listening, thank you for joining us today. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.